Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church here in Winter Haven, Florida. Pleasure to be here with you this morning, if you're with us. And if you're with us virtually, we're glad to be worshiping with you this morning. You may or may not know that Thursday is Thanksgiving. And I have many fond memories of Thanksgiving growing up here in Winter Haven and my mother's pecan pie, which is the best, was the best pecan pie in the world in my opinion anyway, and I always enjoy that. And then when I became a parent, I figured out it's a lot more work being the parent during Thanksgiving. And I heard somebody tell me the other day that Thanksgiving is a compound word, thanks and giving. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I hadn't heard it before. And then they told me a story about somebody who was later in their life, and they wanted to show people the beauty of giving. So they sent 75 people, $75, and told them to use this to help other people and write them back and let them know how, how it went. Well, this person received back responses from most all of the 75 people and how great it was and how much they enjoyed giving and trying to help other people. And many of them said they were gonna continue doing that the rest of their lives. And as the Bible tells us, in Acts 20, verse 35, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than receive. So hopefully we will remember on that on Thanksgiving and be thankful and give as well. We're going to continue the Heart of Worship service with a reading from the Bible, the good news from Lindsay K. something from the book of Psalms. Psalm 145, starting with verse 1, says... I will extol thee, my God and King, and bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee, and praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable.
Thank you, praise band. 
I'd like to add my welcome to Bob's welcome today. It's great to have you online with us on Facebook Live and also great to have you in-house with us today worshiping God. So glad that you chose to worship with us together. At home, you can greet each other however you would like. In the sanctuary, we're still social distancing, so we're doing a welcome wave. So why don't we stand up and wave to one another in Christ's love. Yes, Gail wants to wave to Gwen, so side camera on Gail, please. Good. We try to accommodate here. Announcements today. Just to thank you for all your support of our Saturday Soup Kitchen. Yesterday, the girls from Healthy Start Coalition were our head cooks, and they served 75 hungry people yesterday. So thank you for all that you do to make sure that we continue to feed folks. We still have a couple openings, but not until late December. So if you'd like to help with one of our teams, December 19, December 26, we have some openings on the soup kitchen. So if you'd like to do that, drop downstairs or call into the church office and we'll sign you up on the deacon's board. Next Sunday will be the first Sunday in Advent and we will have communion at both worship services. So we hope you're ready to start the Advent season and prepare your hearts to come to the Lord's table. If you're going to be Joining us virtually next week, we invite you to go ahead and get your bread and juice together. If you would like to come to the church this week, we have the little single-serve communion services that we're going to use. and We'd be glad to provide those for your home celebration. We'll have those here so that we have a reduced contact communion. So if you'd like to come by or people that will be worshiping virtually, we invite you to just to go ahead and prepare your elements at home. Sign-ups are underway for spots for Christmas Eve. We are going to maintain the social distance here in the sanctuary. So we have 50 group seating areas. A group is anywhere from an individual to five or six family members. So you're going to call in, if you would, actually go online. And the 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock services are open right now for reservations. As of Friday, there were still spaces at either of those services, so please go online and make your reservation for yourself or for your family group for Christmas Eve. We'd love to have you join us for candlelight lessons and carols that night. We want you to join us outdoors for a little change in our Come to the Stable. On December 12th, we'll be outdoors as we always are for Come to the Stable, but we've added five musical groups on different stages. So this is the Come to the Stable Living Nativity Stroll. And we hope you'll come and join us as we spend the time outdoors. All the details for all this are in our weekly newsletter, The Tower Chimes, or you can find them online. December 12th, so go ahead and make, reserva or make plans on your calendar. 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock, the stroll will go on. All the events are interactive, and you can spend probably an hour sipping hot chocolate and just moving between the groups and also be a part of experiencing the living nativity with us. Today, we'd love to have you stay around or come back if you're here this early. At 12.15, we're going to have a box lunch downstairs. We're going to have chicken and potato salad, cookies and fruit for anybody who wants to come. And then at 12.30, right after our socially distanced box lunch, we've got McLeod Hall set up. You can be with your groups around tables, so you can be individual. We're all going to join together in decorating the church. This is deck the halls, hanging to the greens. So by 12.30, we'll be here in the sanctuary putting up the two Christmas trees. We'll be hanging the garland. We've got areas all over the church. If you'd like to work individually or in small groups, we can do that. And we hope we'll be done with our decorations by about 2 or 2.30. So please, come today, um, even if you're home and want to come and join us, come 12 o'clock, 12.15 will be the lunch. We're preparing for 50, and so we think we'll have box lunches for 50, and a crowd of 50 would knock this task out in about an hour and a half. A little smaller crowd means just a little more time, but we'd love to have you back here 12.15 for lunch, 12.30 for decorating today. We love having you here. We thank our musicians for helping us to praise God. Let's continue to praise our God.
became flesh, bore my sin in death. Now you're in. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Aurora. Well, Sean was seated down here. We couldn't quite see the flowers, so I just want to go ahead and remind you, you saw it on the photo scroll as we went through the announcements. We want to thank Roger and Marie Abel for um, donating the flowers today. And the announcement that was on the scroll said that Roger and Marie are celebrating their 34th wedding anniversary, and so we celebrate with them on that. And then they also did the honor of adding me in there and recognizing that at 828 this morning, I joined those of you in the 60s club. So, so these were for an anniversary and then they tagged on a birthday celebration. So thank you, Roger and Marie. Gorgeous flowers for worship today. I'd like to invite the children who are here to join me down front now for our time with younger disciples. And I'm gonna grab a stool and Winston and Miller will be right over on this side. Good morning. I bet things are getting pretty busy at your houses. Have you done any decorating lately around the house? You have already? What were you decorating for? Christmas. You've already started some Christmas decorations. Has Winston started some Christmas decorations at his house? You have? Great. What kind of things do you put out for Christmas? Trees. Do you have your tree up already? Do you have your tree up yet? Not yet. What kinds of things would you all put out in addition to trees for Christmas? Ornaments. So you hang ornaments on the trees. Have you made any of those ornaments? Yeah. And there are some special ornaments that you like on the tree. And Winston, I bet you've probably made some ornaments or there's something that you like to see on the tree too. What else do we put out around the house? Trees and ornaments. Cookies. Okay, throughout the season, David puts out cookies. Do they stay all season or do you replace them? <laughs> They're never ending cookies. I have to drop by David's house this Christmas. What else do we put out? Do you have any, we call it garland, green stuff hanging anywhere? Do you do have some? Good. 
by your TV. Wonderful. So lots of different ways that we decorate. Do you put out a nativity set? Something that has the baby Jesus or Mary and Joseph? Some people do that. Well, my house, we're going to be decorating as soon as we get back from a little Thanksgiving trip. And I'll show you one of the things that I just have to have or it's not Christmas. Oh, come on. Takes me a little while to decorate. There we go. What is that? Pine cone tree? Yeah. That's a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Every year, and I have a little peanuts ornament that hangs on it. And what you're supposed to do on this tree is hang the ornament like that. Isn't that beautiful? Well, one of my favorite things are Christmas movies. And one of my favorite little Christmas movies is a thing called The Charlie Brown Christmas. And I've been watching that since I was... Miller, how old are you? I was a little younger than you when I started watching it. That one came out in 1965, I believe. So I was five years old. And every year I've watched The Charlie Brown Christmas. And then several years back... Some people who love me got me a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. And so where we have great big tree at the house and a little tree that has some other ornaments, this little tree finds a place too. And it just reminds me of kind of a favorite way of telling the Christmas story. Because in the Charlie Brown Christmas, Linus, who's one of Charlie Brown's friends, when everybody else has forgotten what Christmas is about, he tells the story of the birth of a baby Jesus. And so I love to hear that. Well, I'm glad you all have started decorating. Miller, you know, because your family's actually doing the lunch for us today. We're going to be decorating the church because next week when people walk in, their houses may be ready, but we want to make sure that God's house is ready. So next Sunday when you come, if we're successful today, there'll be a huge Christmas tree here and a huge Christmas tree there. And when we look at the balcony, there'll be garland all across the balcony. And in the narthex, there'll be a chrismon tree with lots of symbols on it. And as we look around, we'll see nativity sets. And then we'll see candles come. And then the Sunday before Christmas, we'll see poinsettias all up front. And we know that it's ready for Christmas. So, have fun decorating at home. If you get a chance and come back today, we'll have lunch for you. And you can help us decorate God's house. And then every week, let's just look a little bit more at the Advent wreath and the different things that come in to help us get ready for the birth of Jesus. Well, let's fold our hands, let's bow our heads, and let's talk to God in prayer. God, get us ready for the season and help us to prepare our hearts in your house for the celebration of the birth of a Savior. God, we thank you for your great gift to us. And even before Thanksgiving, we're thinking about the most wonderful blessing we've ever received, the birth of Jesus, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for coming today. Beloved children of God, the scripture tells us again and again of God seeking out his people for relationship and our sin leading us away like lost sheep. Yet the Lord pursues us and asks us to let go of our stubbornness, our pride, and to turn back to God. Will you join me in confessing together? our sins to God this morning. Righteous God, you have made Christ the head of the church. We confess, though, that we do not always look to his lead as we live our lives together in ministry. 
Forgive us for the times when we have immersed ourselves in the conversations of the world and not taken the time to turn regularly to your word and scripture. Forgive us for worrying what others might think about what we proclaim, rather than clinging to what you call us in our hearts to say and do. Help us to look longingly to Jesus, to see how your love is lived out in the world, so that we might live our lives reflecting the image of our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Gracious and loving Lord, you call us by name and ask us to return home. May we do that within the deepest of our souls. It is in the powerful name of Jesus that we ask forgiveness. Amen. God searches for the lost and finds us. The Lord invites us and the hungry to the table and feeds us. God, send Jesus and frees us from death's prison. God forgives all who sin and heals us with mercy and grace. Thanks be to God as I declare to you in the name of Jesus the Christ. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, our scripture lesson for today comes to us in the Gospel according to Matthew. I invite you to direct your attention to the screens here in the sanctuary and to your screen at home as we listen for God's Word. Our reading today comes from Matthew chapter 5, a part of the Sermon on the Mount. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, beginning with verse 13. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Friends, says the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have to tell you that I love this church. I love this beautiful old building. I love the people who are a part of this church. I love what we are as the body of Christ in this place. And as a church, I treasure the history that we have together. Part of our collective history goes back to the Roaring Twenties. In Florida, in the Roaring Twenties, it was boom time. In 1920, the population of the great state of Florida was 970,000 people. By 1925, Florida had grown from 970,000 to 1.2 million people, a growth rate of 20% in five short years. Well, Winter Haven itself traces its roots back to the 1880s with about 100 citizens. It grew to a population of 400 by 1900. And by 1911, the time when Winter Haven was being incorporated, in addition to citrus groves and vegetables and floral nurseries, there were schools and a post office, a real estate office, and a social club. In 1911, we had a canning factory and banks, a newspaper, a community band, a movie theater, hotels, and churches including First Presbyterian Church. Back in 1920, the population of Winter Haven was 1,600 people, and more and more people were discovering our fair city every year. Some of the names that we find recorded from that time include Ecclesheimer, Boyd, Harris, Sykes, Jackson, and Inman. 
Dr. Fred Inman and his wife Florence were prominent figures in early Winter Haven. They were among a group of people who back in 1886 had petitioned for the founding of a Presbyterian church. The Inmans had built a lovely home on the shores of Lake Spring, not far from where our Publix is now. As they kept inviting their northern friends to come and visit them in Florida, they added rooms and then wings to their home, and a beautiful tourist hotel was created. In honor of Mrs. Inman, who was the hostess and also co-owner of that estate, they called that hotel Florence's Villa. In 1925, riding the boom of the Florida land, or riding, riding, the, riding the wave of the Florida land boom, the Presbyterians here in Winter Haven were outgrowing their first permanent church structure. You see a picture downstairs of it. It was a few blocks south of here, just a block or two beyond the McDonald's and down the lake towards Lake Howard. Our ancestors in faith were outgrowing that wood structure about the time that the termites were destroying it, and they searched for the site for a new church. In their quest, we're told, they picked the highest piece of land that was available for sale between their original church and Florence's villa, and they sat on this spot right here, which was up on a little hill. There were 200 members of First Presbyterian Church when they broke ground on this sanctuary. Those 200 people spent $265,000 in 1925 to build a church that at the time would seat a little over 800 people, four times their membership. That's vision. That's faith. And I have long realized that we have been the beneficiaries of the blessings of such faith. They built this church on the highest piece of land that they could find, and then they put a window in the front of the church, a window with an image of Jesus reaching out to everybody who passes by and the world outside, and an inscription on the bottom of that window that we can still read if we go out on the front steps, which says, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 11. I imagine when they built this sanctuary, some other words of Jesus from Matthew's gospel were also echoing in their souls and their hearts. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Way back in 1926, when they dedicated this building, the disciples of Jesus Christ, who called this their church home, built a sanctuary on a hill as a mission outpost from which they would continue to serve God and live up to their calling. If you are, you are the salt of the earth, Jesus once said. If the salt loses its taste, if it loses its saltiness, it cannot be restored. It's no longer good for anything. You have to toss it out. There in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, we find Jesus telling the disciples about their purpose in life. He started by saying, you're the salt of the earth. Now, I know salt has fallen in some suspect areas now, according to the medical profession, high blood pressure in the things. But in the time of Jesus, salt was essential. It was a seasoning. It was a preservative. It was crucial to their way of life, and if it ever failed to live up to its purpose, it became worthless. I guess the mini sermon in this words of Jesus is that as the body of Christ, the church, we have a purpose in the world. We're supposed to add some spice to life. We're supposed to preserve what is good. Well, Jesus continued teaching his followers about their purpose and identity by saying, you're the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket, but they put it on a lampstand so it gives light to all in the house. You see, it's about being salt and light and being placed on a hill so that everyone can see and benefit. Jesus continued in the same way, let your light shine before other people so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. 
being disciples of Jesus, giving, living up to our heritage as God's own children, means that we accept our role in the world. That was the message of Jesus to the disciples and the crowds who assembled one day on a mountainside. That was the message that probably inspired people in the Roaring Twenties to build this church on this high piece of ground. That's the message that is echoed in the walls of this church over the years as people have listened to Matthew's gospel. We are to share God's light in our words. We are to show God's love in our works. We're to let our light shine so that others can see the quality of the life that God has planted in us. And they'll join us in giving glory to God. Simply put, we exist as this church to show the world what God is doing for us in Jesus Christ. Well, friends, somewhere between the time that the first group of people petitioned the Presbytery for the organization of a Presbyterian church, that was 1886, and the building of this present sanctuary in 1925, our ancestors in the faith would have been guided by a statement called the Great Ends of the Church. Somewhere around 1910 in the Presbyterian Book of Order, they included the Great Ends of the Church. And so the elders and the members who leaned on that book of order back in the early 1900s here would know what our officers also know as it's still in our book of order now. It says the great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, the nurture, the spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. To get biblical as salt and light, as a city set on a hill, as people who truly believe that we are God's children and called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we have some strong guidance for what we are together as a church. And I love this church as we live up to that calling. I love that we continue to have a vibrant worship life, even when gathering for worship has been a challenge. What we have done this year is rehearsing what it means to be light to the world. I love that we educate children and youth and adults in the Christian faith, and that we support and nurture one another as members of the body of Christ. As we do, we're giving light to all in the house. I love that as we reach out to our community and our nation and our world with care and compassion and justice, we're letting our light shine before others. And hopefully, on the days or in the moments when we get it right, hopefully when we truly do what God is calling us to do and in those moments when the church is the church, it's God that's given the glory as others are touched by God's love through our ministry. A few years back, the session of the church took the great ends and studied them for a while and tried to rework them in some more modern language to make them become the purpose statement for our ministry here together. Here's how we put it then. As a congregation of the Presbyterian Church USA, First Presbyterian Church of Winter Haven, exists to show God's kingdom to the world as we share the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus, as we develop and nurture God's children into disciples, as we provide a place and a program for praising God, as we each live our lives according to the word guided by the Spirit, and as we commit to justice for all God's people. Friends, as we still use this building from the last 20s as our mission outpost moving into the next 20s, we can let Christ's love shine from us and through us. That's why we're still together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us turn our eyes to our Lord and Savior in prayer. Will you pray with me? Every generation has found its home in you, God our provider, and discovered that every moment spent in your holy presence lasts beyond all imaginable time. You watch over us in the night, cradling us in your arms as tenderly as a nurse cares for her children and her neighbors. In the fresh breeze on a summer's day, in the leaves dancing across autumn's lawns, in the crisp new stone snowfall crunching beneath one's feet, in the new life flowering in the spring. From everlasting to everlasting, you proclaim God's grace to us, spirit of life. O oh, loving God, this morning we pray for your healing hand to be, to be upon our divisions, such that we may seek your peace and reconciliation as it is tied to a greater commitment to justice and truth. We pray for our elected leaders, O oh Lord, to promote love and not fear, to act out of mercy and not malice, to work for justice rather than partiality and privilege. Gracious Lord, help us to listen and love, work together in peace, and collaborate with one another as we seek the betterment of our communities and the world. Help us all, Lord, to truly walk alongside and show care and solidarity to our neighbors in this season of thanks for your great mercy. We also lament this morning our deep national pain and the loss from COVID-19 and other viruses, cancers, and diseases that attack one's health. We grieve our loss of control and pray for your ultimate healing, O great physician. We pray for those who surround those ill, those who have a healing hand, the hospital workers, from custodians to doctors. May their strength and knowledge of how best to care for others continue to expand. We give thanks for that care, that time, and that well of compassion that must come from you, O Lord. And we also pray when healing bodily is not possible that we may rest comfortably in your eternal love in that place of no more pain, no more tears. We mourn with those who have lost loved ones and pray for your eternal peace to be grafted into all of our hearts. This morning, gracious Lord, we pray for the countries like Nicaragua and Honduras in the path of hurricanes who are barely recovering from the ravages of previous disasters and the present effects of this pandemic. 
for those communities that do not have the resources to protect themselves in my gate the damages of the storm that seek refuge in other places or remain in their homes taking care of what little they have hold them in your peace in the hope of knowing that you are in control and that nothing can separate them from your love keep them in the palm of your hand like the hen that covers her chicks. May your wings protect them. Provide wisdom and discernment to local authorities, volunteer organizations, and response agencies so that they may best assist all affected and vulnerable people. Move them so that their actions are prompt and effective. May they be instruments of your grace and care. And may they also find strength and peace in you. May we, as your disciples, learn to listen to the deep stories of those you love, Christ, of the lost, the lonely, and the afraid. Those voices that cry out to be honored and taught with love. For those needed to be fed with encouragement. And those we need to pause and lift to you in this silence. So together we can live as your church, your body living in joy and justice, together living as your image breathed into us with your life-giving breath, O creator and redeemer of all. God in community, holy and one, continue to be the dwelling place of our minds, our hearts, our souls, even as we pray as we've been taught as Jesus' disciples to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. is 
Jesus taught and Jesus called. He brought people along in life and he showed them a new quality. He forgave them and he set them on a path of living to the glory of God. He called them salt and light and he said, you're set on a hill so that people will watch what you do and all of us will glorify God together. We're a part of a tradition that goes back to finding the high spot and then trying to be a beacon of God's love to the world. Let's continue that tradition. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. 